All right, so anybody that knows me pretty well would say one thing that I absolutely love is a smoothie. As a matter of fact, I had one this morning for breakfast. I made it myself. I had blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, banana. You can put a little bit of lime in it just to kick it up a notch. And that smoothie was so great because I made it myself. But it would taste just a little bit better if I knew where the product in it came from. And I know you're probably thinking, like, what do you mean you knew where it came from? Like, did you not buy the stuff at the grocery store? Did you not see the label that said blackberries, product of Mexico? Well, sure, but I'm talking about what farm were they grown on? And what was it that caused that blackberry to get from the farm to the plate that I'm eating it off of? And how many different modes of transportation did it take to get there? Well, I have no idea. So I want you to close your eyes with me. And you, know, you see yourself in the grocery store buying your produce. And the produce that you're buying is not coming from all across the world in different regions, but it was actually grown in the exact building you're standing in. Well, that's the idea, basically, behind the vertical farm. Dr. Dixon de Pongay, he's a researcher and a professor at Columbia University, and he has basically made one of his life's missions and goals to kind of solve America's food crisis by implementation and research of the vertical farm. Here in his book, The Vertical Farm, Feeding the World in the 21st Century, he just talks about basically what it is, what a vertical farm is exactly, and what it is that's going to be here in the future. Here you see a vertical farm is basically like a skyscraper. It takes about one city block. And on your lower levels, you have your restaurant or the grocery store. But as you go up, you have different forms of agriculture that are grown in climate-controlled environments that can be grown produce year-round. So you have hydroponics, aquaponics, just different forms, but that's something I'll get to a little bit later. Now, the reason we need these vertical farms in urban settings is because of the population crisis. Well, there's about 7 billion people on the earth right now, but with current population trends, if they continue the way that they are, in the year 2050, just 36 years from now, we're expected to have somewhere around at least another 2 billion people, which is, well, about, you know, too much, because right now we're running out of room to feed ourselves, which is 7 billion, so how are we going to feed an additional 2 billion people? As a matter of fact, it would take a landmass the size of Brazil one and a half times to grow food for just then. And we're already abusing the land we have to grow our own food. So when we can't grow out, we have to grow up. Also, it's beneficial because it's in an urban setting, because 80% of the population in 2050 is supposed to live within 25 to 30 miles of a metropolitan city area. So it's going to be right there to have local, quick, sustainable food access. So I know you're thinking the vertical farm. It's something to look forward to in the future. What, though, are the steps that are being taken done now? You know, there's only a few. There's one in Korea, about four stories. One's being developed in the Netherlands. However, the United States Department of Agriculture currently sets aside 20% of their annual budget to go towards the research and implementation of new farming projects. So the government's already shown the initiative and taken steps to prove that we need to solve this crisis. But what have we done as citizens? Well, it's kind of our fault. I mean, if you think about it, the population increase, it takes people to make people. So, well, it's our fault. So, also, a third of the environmental footprint is caused by us through food-related uh, crisis and food-related causes. So, let me put this into an example for you. So, you're having a dinner party, and you're making Mexican. And you need a chili pepper or something spicy, but you don't have one. So, you send your son to the store to buy it for you. Well, he drives to the store, pick, buys out a pepper, drives back. Well, simple enough, right? But I bet you what you didn't think of is that pepper that was grown in, say, Chile, was picked from a farm, then put on a truck, and driven to a port, then put on an airplane or a boat, taken all the way to America, then taken off of that transportation, put onto another truck, driven across the country to your grocery store just so you can drive home. All of those carbon emissions just for one pepper, when if we had the vertical farm or an urban farm setting, all we'd have to do is go down the flight of stairs. So, like I've said, this idea of making sure we can have quick, local access to the most precious and most sustainable food, you know, we keep needing to have that idea. And a prime example of this is the Walt Disney World Resort, specifically the Epcot Center. Recently, I had the privilege and opportunity of touring their climate-controlled greenhouses, where they actually grow produce year-round for the resort and hotels and restaurants, actually in Disney World, where they, they, they exhibit this idea of having sustainable food. And they also do new, fun, innovative ideas of how to grow things, such as here. 
lettuce being grown in rain gutters and PVC pipes, where it's elevated off the ground and it's conserving space. However, you're reserving the ground if you were to do this outside, per se, for crops or produce that are absolutely necessary to be grown in soil. And I, I know you're thinking probably, what do you mean soil? Doesn't everything have to have soil to be grown? Well, not exactly. Another form of agriculture that they practice is hydroponics. Hydroponics is a form of agriculture where soil isn't even necessary. All that's really needed is sunlight and water, but a nutrient-based solution to where you can make sure you get it to the roots. So technically, like you see here, you can hang plants from the ceiling, and as long as the roots are getting the nutrients that it needs, it'll still grow and thrive. So you see the Walt Disney World Resort, that's in Florida, and I've talked about having peppers coming all the way from Chile. So obviously this is a national and an international importance. But here in Kentucky, specifically Lexington and the University of Kentucky, there's even been changes that have happened. Uh, back in 2009, the University of Kentucky participated in something called the Solar Decathlon. It was an event sponsored by the United States Department of Energy where they encouraged students to build basically a home, but make sure it was energy efficient and self-sustaining. So UK, when they built theirs, decided they were going to do theirs with water conservation and having a sustainable food source. So instead of having like, ornamental landscapes, they decided, let's put in a garden. So rooftop or patio gardens, instead of having a rose bush, they may have had a tomato plant, or they may have had lettuce heads growing, <coughs> so they can get their food access from their home and not have to worry about it traveling thousands of miles. Another example, right here in Lexington, is an organization called Food Chain. Food Chain uh, is known for practicing things such as aquaponics, another form of agriculture, where you have fish such as tilapia, or another fish that you would eat. You have them in a tank, and then you have the produce or the things that you're trying to grow, and you put them on top of the tank to where the fish feed off of those produce or the things, and then the waste from the fish is then recycled through the tank to fertilize the plants. It's a self-sustaining <coughs> system. So you have this, and they take, or Food Chain specifically takes aquaponics into other organizations, into schools here in Lexington to kind of spread that message to our youth and people to make sure that everybody understands this idea that I've said of making sure we can have a sustainable but is close to home and local food source. So, I know you're thinking now, how can I get involved? Well, I don't have time to start an organization like Food Chain, but I want to make a difference. It's simple. There's many things you can do, but I would encourage you, make a micro garden. It's very easy. All you can do, put a garden in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> Truck farm. Uh, it was a documentary that was done, and it was uh, about a truck farm, basically, in New York City, about someone has their food, quick, ready access, wherever they go. Another way you could do it, in a cargo ship container for a train. You could do a patio garden in your backyard. It's really something, whatever you want, just make sure you keep that mindset of local, sustainable, quick access. So, although we can't walk down the street right now, and pick out a coconut or a papaya or something that's grown from some faraway region of the world, that's okay. But that's something that we need to keep in mind when we're looking forward to the future. And right now, as citizens, what we can do is make sure that we support and we participate in every opportunity that we see to get local, sustainable, and quick, easy access to as much food and produce as possible. And not only will this help solve this food crisis, but it will help us and those additional two billion people from no fault of their own from going hungry. It will also help change the way that we as American citizens grow and get our food access now and for the rest of the future. Thank you.